there she is, all $41,000 of her. Hola y'all, it's Michelle, AKA Shelly Flowers, and you are watching my channel, Shelly Flowers Reads and Writes, where I talk about all things related to books and writing. So today is definitely gonna be a much more writing-based video, and I think considering the time of year that we're in, it's May, there's a lot of graduations happening, people are reminiscing about their times in college, I wanna talk about a video that has been very near and dear to my heart for a while, and that is my experience getting a Master of Fine Arts, AKA, and MFA. So why am I deciding to do this now? Well, like I said before, I'm definitely reminiscing a lot on my time at my alma mater, NYU, New York University. Um, but I also wanted to talk about some of the experiences that I had while I was in the program. Also, I did what I thought was gonna be impossible and I paid off my student loans last month. Yay! Um, in total, my time at NYU for two years cost me $41,000 that I have been paying off for the past nine years. Now, I will say the majority of my student loan debt was paid off in the past two years. I paid off about $20,000 in the past two years. I work as a teacher, so it's not as if I'm exactly flowing in the money. I also work as a teacher in Florida, which is a state that historically pays its teachers at some of the worst rates compared to other states around our country. So. I don't want to give the impression that I somehow did this in an insanely short amount of time or that it didn't take some insane budgeting and, and all of that. In fact, this video is not even about how I paid off my student loans. I really want this video to be a resource to use if you yourself are considering getting an MFA and some things that you should think about before you decide to jump into a program like that. I will also say Alexa Dunn made an excellent excellent video about this very same topic though her perspective was more for getting an mfa in children's literature i'm going to link that video down below because i think she talks about some things that i myself am probably not going to mention in this video um but she also did not get an mfa herself so she was doing this based primarily off of her research that being said it's alexa dunn so you know her research is always going to be on point now the other person that i'm going to link down below is bookish pixie I believe that they had uh, an MFA from Simmons College, which they talk a little bit about their experience getting an MFA. And I believe there's also Dimitri Reyes Poet who talked about whether or not someone should get an MFA. Um, so I'm gonna link all of their videos down below and you guys can use this as sort of like a jumping off point and, and find some of those resources there. So the first thing that I wanna talk about my experience with getting an MFA is that my experience 100% was not the typical experience of someone getting an MFA. The main reason is during my last year of undergrad, my mother was diagnosed with a glioblastoma brain tumor. And so while I was in New York City pursuing this degree, I was also flying home to Miami regularly because my mom was going through cancer treatments. And anyone who knows anything about brain cancer knows it tends to be one of the more aggressive forms of cancer that someone can be diagnosed with. So, with that being said, I think my experiences are not always super typical, but I do think that is something that you should consider because at the end of the day, paying money into your education is an investment and with investment comes risk. And as we know, life in general tends to be a, a risk. We are thrown constant things at us that really prevent us from being able to rise within our desires and our goals and you know this this whole quarantine coronavirus situation is such an excellent example of that and looking at what now i think the numbers are over 30 million people filing for unemployment and so i do want to bring up this idea that just because you pursue an mfa doesn't mean that everything is going to go perfectly according to plan and you need to consider that life is going to happen while you pursue this degree so with that being said, I just want to talk about my process on how I applied to the programs and why I selected NYU over the other programs. So I'm going to take you back all the way to the fall of 2008. If anybody recognizes that year, you know this was the year which created the Great Recession. Um, being an English major in that time period was not the best. It was real scary and I just didn't know what I was going to do after undergrad. I went to Florida State and 
I was in the English department, I got my degree in creative writing, I was getting ready to graduate, and I literally just did not know what to do next. So I talked it over with my mom, I talked it over with um, my uncle, who was the first person in our family to go to college. So I, I kind of just consulted with him and based off of my conversations with people plus my own research, I decided, like most English majors who don't know what to do after undergrad, I need to go to grad school. And specifically, I wanna get my degree in creative writing because that's what I like to do, I like to write. I don't think that that was necessarily the smartest way to come up with that decision. However, given that my parents themselves did not go to college and given that my only resource was my uncle who lived in Washington DC while I was living in Tallahassee, I just made the best decision with the information that I had at the time. I applied to five programs, University of Miami, Brown University, Hollins College, Simmons College, and New York University. I got rejected from both University of Miami and Brown. The University of Miami rejection really stung because right around when I was getting those acceptances, my mom was diagnosed with her brain cancer and I was hoping that I could have just stayed in Miami and gone to school and taken care of her at the same time, but that is not how the cards worked out for me. I then got into three programs. The first one was Hollins University's Low Residency MFA program. So for those of you who don't know, a low residency program is essentially where you only have to go for short amounts of time throughout the school year. So for example, in Hollins, they just had three summer sessions, three consecutive summer sessions. That meant basically in the summer, I was gonna be at Hollins and I was gonna be working on my MFA, but for the rest of the year, I could have worked, I could have focused on my manuscript, I could have taken care of my mom. Um, and because of that, the program itself was a lot more affordable than some of the other options that I got into. I think I could have easily lived at home to help take care of my mom and found a job throughout the year that would have helped me save up money to pay for that program. <sighs> that being said, as a stubborn 20 year old, I wanted to go to a school that I felt was gonna get me better connections and had more of a name recognition. Don't be me. <laughs> um, so, with that being said, the other school that I got into was Simmons College, and I got into their MFA in children's literature program. Now, Simmons College had some pros and cons to it. The pro was that I would get to focus on children's literature, which at that point in my life was definitely my passion. The con, though, was that Simmons College was really expensive. Um, I think it cost about the same as going to NYU did. I didn't really know anything about Boston, and it was freezing cold it still is <sighs> here's the thing y'all i'm from miami florida i am someone who thrives in tropical and subtropical climates i hate the cold and knowing what i knew about boston i know that i probably would have loved the program but not loved where i was living and that is something that i think is so important to thinking about when you decide to go to a program I tend to be very inspired by the places I lived, and so if I don't like where I'm living, chances are I'm not gonna be writing a lot either. The last program that I got into was my all-time number one dream school, New York University. I actually got into New York University for undergrad, but because of the cost, my family and I decided it wasn't gonna be a good fit. And the cost for grad school was still very expensive, but, because it was a graduate degree, it would be worth it in a way that, you know, shelling out $200,000 for an undergraduate degree just was not worth it. So the pro, of course, it's my dream school. I get to live in New York City, which was a dream of mine as well. The con was that I would have to live in New York City. And as I already said, I don't like the cold. It's also hella expensive there. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I just think overall, like NYU was definitely my top choice but there were some drawbacks that came with it. So I presented my mom with all of these options because I wanted to make sure that whatever decision I made, she, she was gonna be okay with it as well. For me, at the end of the day, while I knew that I really wanted this degree, I knew that I didn't have a lot of time left with my mom. So I had to make sure whatever decision I made, I was gonna be able to see my mom when I needed to and do something that I knew she was gonna be happy with and I was gonna be happy with at the end of the day. So with that, we decided NYU was gonna be our best bet. Now, 
she didn't co-sign on my student loans. My uncle did that. She said, you know, with everything health-wise that I have going on, financially, we just can't help you with this process. And I understood that. So my uncle co-signed my loans and I figured I'm gonna keep doing what I've always been doing. I'm gonna make the choices that I want to make for my own life and I will figure out how to make it work for myself. And so that's what I did. I ended up going to NYU and Aside from the cost, I have to say, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I think living outside of Florida, getting to experience such a different lifestyle than anything I'd experienced before, has truly shaped me into the person that I am today. Now, with all that being said, there are four main buckets that I wanna talk about when I think about my experience at NYU, because I think these are honestly the buckets that are the most impactful on how I reflect on my time at that university. Um, and I think these are also things that you should consider as you make your decisions on whether or not you should get an MFA. So those four main topics are cost, professors, networking, and time to write. I think at the end of the day, these are the four things that should impact your decision the most. And there's pros and cons to each of them. But please keep in mind, I went to NYU almost 10 years ago. It's not the same university that it was back then. MFAs in general are a lot more readily available. Okay, so the first topic that I wanna talk about is cost. When I went to NYU, it cost about $10,000 per semester just for the graduate program. That means you were paying $10,000 a semester to take two classes related to your creative writing degree. That's a lot of money just to take two classes a semester. That does not include the cost of living, of living in New York City, the most expensive city in the entire country and one of the most expensive cities in the world. So if you do decide that going to a school in New York is something that you want to do, please factor in how much money it's going to cost to live in that city. To put things in perspective, I took out $41,000 over my two years at NYU. That means I spent about $20,000 a year while living in New York City. I will also clarify, I got a partial scholarship to go to NYU. So half of my tuition was covered, which meant I was spending $5,000 on my tuition $15,000 on living expenses, and then I also had a part-time job to help cover any extra incidentals. That's it. I don't know how I survived, and I don't know how I did it. I was lucky enough to find a dorm that provided meals two times a day. I took advantage of any kind of free event that I could go to that provided food, um, but it was a struggle. It was a big struggle, and I think that's definitely something that people need to consider if they want to go to grad school. Consider where this school is located because that's going to impact the cost of the program. Consider how expensive the classes actually are when you decide to take them. Um, because at the end of the day, just because you pay more for something doesn't mean it's better. And I'm not saying that's the case with NYU because at the end of the day, NYU is one of the best programs for creative writing in the country. But at the same time, you really need to consider cost. Education is an investment. Your return on investment might not equal what you've actually put into your writing. I'm a published author and I've barely made a fraction of what I paid for my degree. So I think you really need to take that kind of thing into consideration. I will say if you find a program that is less than $10,000 to go, particularly if it's sort of like a low residency program that you can just travel to a couple times a year, or if it's a program that happens to be in the city that you already live in, $10,000 or less to me is actually a pretty good investment because you can probably make that type of money back with your writing if you are willing to really hustle and push yourself and, and you know, make a name for yourself in the literary world. But if you're thinking this degree is somehow automatically going to open some doors for you, I can tell you right now that that's not the case. It's, it's just not going to do that. The next topic that I want you to consider when you decide on joining an MFA program are the professors that teach at that university. Now, I was really lucky. My very first workshop was with Sharon Olds. If you don't know anything about poetry and you have no idea who I'm talking about, Sharon Olds is a living legend. She won the Pulitzer a few years ago. Her first book was published when she was 30 and she has just amassed this insane 
obra of work that just spans decades, spans movements. She really pioneered conf confessional poetry. Um, and honestly, to have my first workshop be with her, the bar was set so high. And honestly, NYU delivered. I also took courses with Megan O'Rourke. Yusuf Komanyaka was my thesis advisor, which is just like, what? Um, Major Jackson was one of my intro to poetry professors. And so he really helped us understand the history of poetry and how it became the form that it is today. I also got to take this one course and I'm forgetting the professor's name. So I feel so bad about that. But I took this one class where this professor specialized in poetic translation. And so every book we read was from an author that spoke a different language. And it happened to be in a class where everyone in the class spoke the languages of one of the books that we read. So it was so incredible to hear poetry in native Polish, Hebrew, Spanish, you know, and it just rocked my entire world. And the level of education that I got from these professors, I adored. However, I also had some professors that really made me question whether or not I should be in the program. I remember taking one workshop where I was with this professor and it was so clear when she liked a student's work and when she didn't. And I'm not saying that professors should not be giving feedback on work because that is essential. The only way you're going to get better is if you get feedback and sometimes that feedback is going to be negative. What I'm talking about is that clear example of favoritism where you can tell every time she reads a poem by a certain person, she already had that kind of bias towards that person's work. And then when work was by people that she didn't necessarily like, you could also tell because she could never really pull out anything positive to say about their work. That is going to happen when you go to a program. And at times it can feel really frustrating when you're paying upwards of $5,000 to take a class. It can feel really frustrating to know that your professor is not taking you seriously as a writer. So do your research on the professors that are teaching at the program you want to go to. Make sure you actually enjoy and respect the work that they're producing. And make sure that you advocate for yourself. If you notice this happening within your course, don't be like me. Don't stay in that person's class. Make some noise. Complain about it. Tell them you want a different course. At the end of the day, this is an investment on your education and you need to take ownership of it. So if you realize that the school that you are spending money on is not providing you a service, demand better service. This is a mistake that I made and I stayed in that course for an entire year. She disrespected so much of the work that I was trying to produce in a time when I was already going through so much in my personal life. I didn't need to take that kind of disrespect. And that is just something that I really want to caution you guys on. You're going to have professors that just don't see the value in the work that you're producing. It's up to you to either change their mind or request a different professor. And that's really unfortunate because I think if it wasn't for that one professor, I, I would have had a perfect professorial experience at NYU. So it does make me kind of sad that that one class really does color my entire experience there. Okay, so the next big thing that I want you to consider as you decide which program you want to go to for grad school is networking. Sorry, so that's my dog. She's being extra protective right now. So I appreciate it, but she's loud. <laughs> okay, so I think I was talking about networking before my dog lost her mind. Um, and she might continue barking in the background. I'm sorry about that. She gets really protective anytime she hears any noise or sees a cat, loses her mind. Um, but networking. I'm going to be completely upfront. I did not do a very good job of this while I was in school for obvious reasons. I had to be out of town once a month. Oftentimes when I was out of town, there would always be some kind of special event that was going on. So here's what I'll say. If your program offers these kinds of networking events, go to them, take advantage. Oftentimes they are just additional professional development or academic development that's only gonna help you out in your writing career. For example, NYU would hold panels with particular authors who were either alumni of the program or were just the top writers in their particular genre, right? So some people that 
and um nyu has hosted in the past have been people like sandra cisneros or denez smith or morgan parker um and so getting to hear their perspectives is really essential um they also hold different courses about publishing so i just attended a couple weeks ago a free online workshop that they were holding for current students and alumni um, to learn about publishing and how to break into the publishing industry. It wasn't necessarily any information that I didn't already know, but I appreciated hearing from people who were literally working in that field. So some people included alumni from NYU, there was a literary agent present, there was one of the editors from Grey Wolf Press, which is one of my favorite presses right now. Um, and so just getting to hear their experience and their advice firsthand is really helpful. I think the other form of networking that is so, so important, particularly if you're a poet, is attending readings and open mics. I only got to go to two, but I've done more open mics 10 years after graduating than I ever did in my program, which is ironic. You would think that I would want to go out there and perform my work more often, but I just didn't know anyone who was hosting them. And I, I didn't have that connection with a lot of my classmates to know when to go to these things and where I should go and, and who I should talk to about getting on the set list. Don't make that mistake. Get to know people in your program, get to know who's hosting what. There were also opportunities for being published in literary magazines. And if I had just known how to network with people a little bit better, um, I could have had some of those opportunities. So I think that's definitely something to learn from my mistake. It's so unfortunate and it's so frustrating, but it's just the reality of traditional publishing, even in poetry, a lot of times it's about who you know, not just what you're writing. So people who know publishers, people who know these literary agents, people who know other writers, that's oftentimes how they get published. And you can't just depend on this degree or this manuscript to get you by. You have to put in the work of talking to people, getting to know people, um, attending these workshops and it just, it is what it is. That's the game that we've got to play if we want to be traditionally published. I would also say though, even if you want to be self-published, you still have to learn how to build your brand. You still have to learn how to connect with people who might be able to market your book. You still have to learn how to work with an editor and, and find resources like that. So no matter what path you decide to take, it's important that you understand you are going to be in control at the end of the day of your own career so you need to practice that muscle of reaching out to people that you don't know and creating like a mutual symbiotic relationship there so that's all i'm saying learn from my mistake branch out of your comfort zone get to know people at the end of the day too i think writers want to support other writers poets want to support other poets people want to support each other we want to buy each other's books. We want to see each other get published. Everybody wants to see everyone win. And so I think when you start to approach some of these networking situations from that mindset, it helps you out a lot. You are talented. You are worthy. You are putting in the work. So talk about yourself and be willing to put yourself out there to build those connections. So the last thing that I want to talk about that I think you should consider if you decide to get an MFA is the amount of time you want to spend writing. Different styles of MFAs give you different types of writing and they can also push you to write in different kinds of genres. So for example, in that publishing event that I attended a few weeks ago, a literary agent talked about how an MFA program for fiction writers specifically is oftentimes designed to help these writers produce collections of short stories. And it's why you tend to see people who get their MFA, the first thing that they publish is a book of short stories. However, those particular books are not very well selling and they are not that easily marketable. So that's something to keep in mind. If you don't like to write short stories or if you don't want to write short stories, make sure that the program you are signing up for gives you time to write full length novels. I don't see many programs that actually do that because most MFA programs work in a workshop style where every week or a couple times a week, you meet with your entire class, you sit in a big circle and it's about 
15 to 30 people depending on the size of the class and everybody reads one person's work gives them all kinds of feedback and then that person who got the feedback has to stay silent and just take in that feedback and then make adjustments to their manuscript as necessary. I don't know that that style of writing is necessarily conducive to a novel because I don't really see an entire class reading someone's novel. Maybe they read chapters in the novel, but that is something to consider is just what type of work do you want to produce and how long do you think it's going to take for you to produce it? For poets, I think that style actually works out a little bit better because that equates to one poem a week. You get a lot of feedback on it and then you can either implement the feedback right away or sit on that for a little bit and then implement the feedback. But either way, you've got this, you know, page by page building process of what will eventually be your final manuscript. Um, so if we count a semester in 12 weeks, that's about a poem a week for 12 weeks. Four times 12 is 48. So that's a chat book, essentially. Um, you probably won't use every single poem, but you'll probably leave the program with like 30 solid poems that you can use. But you might end up like me where one of the semester you attended a workshop run by a professor who doesn't necessarily respect your perspective. So that's something else to keep in mind. Now, if you attend a low residency program, it's a little bit different because with the low residency program, you are away from the program for months at a time and then you get to meet up to workshop some of the pieces that you've come up with. So that might actually be more conducive to people who want to write a novel or who have like a very specific trajectory of what they want their poetry manuscript to look like. Um, and this could also be applicable to nonfiction MFAs and screenwriting MFAs. I just tend to focus on fiction and poetry because those were the programs that were available at NYU. So I probably should have said that at the start, but that that's something else to consider as well. Now, there is this joke about MFA programs that it's essentially creating a manuscript by committee because of that workshop style that I talked about. That might not be your writing process. You might be someone who needs to do it all by themselves first and then presents it to an editor and then presents it to a publisher. Um, I think this is where understanding yourself as a writer is really, really important. If you were young like me, getting an MFA might not be a bad thing because it can teach you how to create a writing process for yourself. If you're someone who's older though, getting an MFA might not be the best thing if you already have a consistent writing process that really works for you. So when I think about time to write, I think you just need to consider what type of work are you trying to create if you know at all the type of work that you're trying to create and what might it take for you to get there. And that's going to look different for everybody, depending on what your overall goals are. So to conclude, overall, I, as an adult, have very mixed feelings about MFA programs. I personally overall loved my experience at NYU, but I don't necessarily think that the cost of going to that program has proven to be a good return on my investment as of late. I don't know though, because I also did just publish my first chat book. I've got a picture book coming out. I'm working on a novel. So maybe it just took me longer to process the things that I learned in that program. I think a lot of that is also impacted by the fact that my mother passed away while I was in the program. And there were a few years there where I just couldn't write because I was grieving. So my experience is probably not gonna mirror yours. Hopefully it doesn't and hopefully you can have a much more straightforward experience, but that's just how my situation panned out. I will also say that I am finding more and more the people whose writing I respect didn't occur because they got an MFA. Some of my favorite authors right now don't have MFAs. Yesica Salgado has a GED. I also really appreciate writers who studied other areas aside from writing, right? So you have Leah Naomi Green, who just won the Walt Whitman Award. She's an environmental scientist. She teaches English and science courses. And I think that makes her work so different and so interesting compared to what's going on right now. You have people like Elizabeth Acevedo, who yes, she did get an MFA, but she was doing slam poetry and was excelling in that field long before she got her MFA. I just wonder if maybe the MFA program itself is even necessary 
um, or if it's really just a way to give people teaching credentials that they need to teach in university. I know that was the main reason why I wanted to get mine. Aside from working on a manuscript, I also wanted to be able to teach at the university level. That hasn't happened for me yet. So again, that just shows how much the MFA can really impact you. And I also think, you know, getting a master's degree in a different field could be just as impactful on my work. Like sometimes I wonder if maybe I'd gotten a master's degree in Latinx studies or Caribbean studies, how might that have impacted my work over time? I say all that just to say, you need to think about what your goal is at the end of the day with getting an MFA. If your goal is to create a manuscript, you don't need an MFA to do that. Will it help guide you and kind of put all of this information that's out there in the world together into one place? Definitely, 100% it will. Is that going to be the difference maker in whether or not your manu manuscript's good? I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, the best writers read a lot, they live their lives, and they do research on the kinds of topics that they're wanting to write about. At the end of the day, I loved going to NYU. I think it was such an incredible experience. Even with everything that I had going on in my personal life, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. However, knowing what I know now and knowing what I understand about debt and building generational wealth and making way for people like me who spaces like NYU were not designed for, um, I don't know that I would necessarily have made the same decision. And that makes me kind of sad to say. That is something that I didn't talk about as much, but I do think it's an important thing to note. Being a person of color, being an LGBTQ person, being a neurodivergent person, being a disabled person in a space like an MFA program, hell, even growing up as a poor person, and then going to an MFA program, particularly one like M NYU, you're going to question your identity a lot. And you're going to question whether or not this space is actually right for you. There's an article about being in an MFA program as a person of color that I'm going to link down below because I think it's really important to consider. Remember, a lot of these institutions were not created for people like us. And you're going to feel it when you're in the program. I think universities have tried to fix some of those issues but publishing in itself is still a very white cis hetero space and if you don't fit into those categories it can be a struggle and you can constantly feel like your identity is being pigeonholed so i don't know if what i'm saying makes any sense but it is something to consider as well um it's sort of like a bonus point to consider um because I think oftentimes we focus so much in this country on getting education for education's sake that we don't stop to actually consider how is that education gonna impact you as a person? So that's all. Um, I know that there was sort of a lot being discussed in all of this and this video is pretty long. It's definitely one of my longer videos, but I hope that this helps you out in terms of deciding whether or not an MFA program is right for you. If there's anything in this video that I didn't cover that you do want to learn about, please reach out and let me know. I have no issues addressing specific questions that you might have. You can message me on Instagram at Shelly Flowers. I also have a Tumblr at Shelly Flowers. Um, if you want to keep track of what I'm reading lately, um, you can find me on Goodreads at Shelly Flowers. And if you are curious about what my manuscript looked like when I left NYU, my book, Gwinthos from the Swamp, most of those poems came from that manuscript. So check that out, let me know what you think. And at the end of the day, remember, education is an investment. And some degrees have a better return of investment than others. A creative writing degree does not make you a writer, you make you a writer, and writers write. So with all that, all I wanna say is, I love y'all, I hope you stay safe, wash your hands, and I hope you do some good writing. Ciao y'all.